Yeah, perfect. Okay. So um, I, I just, I'm going to be showing you some pictures um, from the operating room and every patient included in these pictures has um, provided consent. I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. I don't get any money from um, Intuitive or um, uh, Minogue, which are the um, pr uh, producers and suppliers of the Da Vinci robot. Um, and I will um, give you my most unbiased uh, opinion about where I think robotic surgery really has its role. So I'm an OBGYN and a minimally invasive surgeon at St. Mike's. I am a clinician investigator, so I have protected time for research. I, I do a lot of population-based studies through ICES. And my clinical interests include low risk obstetrics, not the kind of obstetrics that Dr. Van Meegan is going to um, talk about in a little bit, uh, but low risk obstetrics, minimally invasive surgery, including robotics, as well as colposcopy. So um, I spend about a day uh, in my gynecology clinic. I try to um, uh, tailor referrals that I accept to um, surgically focused referrals. Um, so I have a high surgical volume. Um, I spend half a day in antenatal clinic, uh, half a day in colposcopy, a day on, in the OR and a day on the labor floor and then another day doing research. Um, so it is a, it is a busy uh, practice that I have, but um, I really do enjoy my job. Um, in addition to my work, um, I, I grew, so I grew up in Toronto. I went to a Western university for my undergraduate degree, then medical school, um, at U of T residency here. My fellowship was at St. Mike's and, um, during fellowship, I, uh, did my master's in health services research at the Institute for Health Policy Management and Evaluation. Um, while I was doing fellowship and master's, I had my first, um, uh, baby who's Abigail there on the left. And then in my, um, uh, within my first year of being on staff, I had my second, who's Josh. Um, so the, right now they are three and one and a half. So I've only been in practice for just over two years now. Um, my surgical portfolio includes, um, so really all surgical access routes. Um, and that's one of the things that uh, myself and my group at St. Mike's really pride ourselves in, that we can operate open, laparoscopic, vaginal, and robotic. Um, so we really try to tailor our approach based on what's best for the patient, um, not the route that we know how to do. Um, and the robotic, um, I'll speak specifically about robotic surgery in this presentation and some of the criteria that we use to decide if um, we're going to use a robotic approach. Um, I'm not an oncologist, I'm a general gynecologist, so I treat premalignant and benign disease, but I also treat grade one endometrial cancer, um, typically in patients with an elevated body mass index. And the reason that general gynecologists treat grade one endometrial cancer is that there has been no benefit shown to nodal dissection. So they um, are treated with a hysterectomy alone, and that typically is curative. So robotic surgery, the setup sort of looks like this, where you have a surgeon in the console, a first assist at the bedside, and then in our case, a second assist who is um, manipulating the uterus. So sitting between the patient's legs and um, moving the uterus um, uh, as needed. Um, so uh, I mentioned that most of the patients we treat have an elevated BMI, and I really do think that this is where the benefit of the robot is. So um, I don't think that the robot should be, is caught, it's neither cost effective um, uh, and it, it's, it, it's not um, um, really ideal in, in all cases, but there's a few reasons why robotic hysterectomy is so um, important in women with a body mass index above 40. Um, these patients are very surgically challenging and myself and the three other robotic surgeons that I work with at St. Mike's um, get a high volume of referrals from really all over Ontario now for um, patients with this indication. And there is no shortage of these patients. As you know, the population prevalence of obesity is rising and obesity is a very strong risk factor for grade one endometrial cancer, as well as atypical endometrial hyperplasia. So these patients really do benefit from robotic uh, hysterectomy. Um, as you can see in this picture, this is um, our setup. So um, there usually is, you know, a lot of abdominal adiposity um, and we have to tip the patient back into steep Trendelenburg to really get all of the bowel um, out of the pelvis so that we can see where we're operating. So we are constantly in a battle with anesthesia as we you know, inflate the abdomen, put our pneumoperitoneum in. They are um, trying to ventilate the patient. So they're battling against us to try to ventilate the patient properly. And one of the things that the robot does compared to um, 
uh, traditional laparoscopy is that you can bump up your ports. So when we dock the robot and attach them to our laparoscopic port, you can actually lift the abdominal wall with the robot and we can lower intra-abdominal pressures quite a bit. So um, for conventional laparoscopy, our um, operating pressures are usually 15 uh, millimeters of mercury. We have done robotic cases as low as six millimeters of mercury for very high BMI patients um, if we cannot vent ventilate them any other way and we have adequate visualization because of this ability to bump up the ports. Um, it's also 3D. There is 3D laparoscopy, but the, the 3D camera that we have for the robot is phenomenal. So um, the surgeon has really excellent visualization um, and it's great when you're working in excess adipose tissue. The arms articulate. So instead of straight skip stick laparoscopy where you have two planes of movement, you basically have wrists. Um, so it makes it a lot easier to learn. And there's been studies showing that the learning curve for robotic surgery is a lot shorter than it is for laparoscopy. You don't have any tactile feedback. So you can't rely on your haptics, meaning that you don't know how hard you're pulling um, because you are sitting in a console operating and the robot is separate from you. So um, initially when we, we train our fellows here in robotic surgery, and this is where I learned robotic surgery, um, you break a lot of sutures at the beginning because you forget how hard you're pulling and you learn over time to rely more on what you're seeing and not what you're feeling. And eventually when you've been doing it long enough, you convince yourself that you're feeling. The surgeon also has a third arm. So in laparoscopy, you operate with two arms, um, two instruments. With the robot, you can um, place one of your instruments, your third arm, so you can grab um, you know, the bladder flap or something like that, retract it out of the way and then leave it there. And the robot holds it there for you. And then you take your other two hands and you can operate with those. And then finally, it's very ergonomic. So this is really good with longer cases, less operator fatigue, less torque on the instruments. So the patients experience less post-operative pain because your instruments are rotating around a fixed point instead of being constantly moved. And for, um, you know, some surgeons do have tremor that they have to kind of work against and it filters out all that tremor. Um, this is me during fellowship. Um, I was about 37 weeks pregnant there um, with Abigail. And um, you can see that it's very ergonomic and, and very comfortable to operate um, even uh, late in pregnancy. So um, these are some pictures from our operating room at St. Mike's. Um, this is one of our OR nurses just prepping the robot. So this is putting the sterile drapes on all the arms of the robot in advance of the case. This is a picture of the console. So this is where the surgeon sits and you can see the, um, there's uh, manipulators for your hands here, um, binoculars where you put your eyes in and you can only actually manipulate things with the robot if your forehead is pressing in here. If you move your head back, um, the, the console will, will freeze. You won't be able to operate. Um, and then at the bottom here, we have all the pedals. So you can see on the left side um, here is camera control to zoom in and out with your camera. Um, there is a pedal on the left side as well that lets you switch between your third arm. And then there's bipolar and monopolar cautery on the right side. So you are doing a lot and manipulating a, a lot as the surgeon, and it takes um, a while to learn all of these um, mechanics. So the surgeon sits in the console and you um, place your hands um, to manipulate the robot here. Um, this is a training video. I'm not sure if it'll work. It's a very short video, just essentially showing how the instruments work. And this is one of our residents who was um, practicing on the robot. So while she's sitting apart from it, um, you um, uh, can manipulate the instruments. Oops, sorry. Um, so this is just another picture of the same case. So there I am sitting in the console doing the operation. This is the second assist sitting between the patient's legs and the robot is over here and it was docked uh, next to the patient. Um, and you can see that there's lots of screens to make sure everybody can see. And then this is the first assist. Um, this is my colleague, Dr. Kivas. Um, and uh, the first assist has usually one port um, and is there to assist with passing sutures, um, retraction, that sort of thing, but just has one laparoscopic port while the surgeon has three arms. And the job of the first assist is really important because if you ever did get into a bleeding emergency, it's that person who's there and scrubbed who would have to undock the robot really quickly and get in um, uh, via laparotomy. Not a common occurrence, but that it, it is important that your first assist knows how to undock the robot quickly if needed. Um, 
so um, just before I get into our team, um, so we, as I mentioned before, we have a really um, big referral base for grade one endometrial cancers and atypical hyperplasia from all over Ontario. Um, so those are the criteria that we really use for the robot at our center. The one other type of case that we will do with the robot is myomectomy, so removal of a fibroid in women who want to preserve fertility. Um, and it, it's best if there's you know one or two large fibroids where the benefits of um, having the um, articulating arms for suturing, you're doing a lot of suturing with a myomectomy. So that's where we really do see the benefit um, in that population. Um, we have done some research looking at um, the benefit of robotics over conventional laparoscopy. And we did find um, in our systematic review that there were fewer conversions to laparotomy for patients with a high BMI if the robot was used instead of laparoscopy for those reasons that I talked about before. So. I feel very strongly that, you know, we have a pa patient population at risk who deserves the best standard of care. Um, their weight should not be, um, uh, a you know, a deterrent from being offered the best care possible. Um, unfortunately, this is a very marginalized population that often see a lot of surgeons who don't feel comfortable operating on them. They get bounced around a lot. Um, they're told you need to just lose some weight before we can operate on you, even if they have cancer which is um, you know, not, not fair to anyone. Um, so this is a population where I really feel that we need more advocacy to um, uh, have the robot available um, to service this population. Because if anything that we can do to reduce the risk of them needing a laparotomy is really important. Um, with laparotomy, they have wound complications, prolonged recovery, increased incidence of um, PE and DVT. Um, and I've also done looked at some Ontario data basically showing that if you can complete the surgery through a minimally invasive approach, they have equivalent outcomes to patients with a low BMI. Um, so this is our surgical team here. Um, again, I'm like, um, three, eight weeks pregnant in this picture. Um, it was, uh, they wanted to get the photo op done before I went on parental leave. Um, so that's um, uh, me and then Dr. Deborah Robertson, who is the director of our fellowship at St. Michael's Hospital. Dr. Sari Kivas. Um, Dr. Kivas is actually one of the, um, I think in Ontario, she has been using the robot longer than anyone else for benign um, gynecology. And then our newest hire, who is also our fellow, Dr. Alicia Nancy. Um, so the four of us um, uh, are the robotic surgeons at St. Mike's. Um, I just wanted on the last two slides just to um, leave you with a couple thoughts about, uh, I know a lot of you are, you know, I think you're all here because you're interested in surgery. And um, when you choose a career, think about um, a, a couple things. So what, the first of them, like what moments in medicine really give you all the feels? So whether it's delivering a baby, um, telling a patient that you have, um, you know, cured their cancer, um, what, what really gives you kind of that warm and fuzzy feeling and then what parts of medicine have stopped time for you. And, you know, for me, it's definitely being in the operating room and, um, I, that's my favorite part of my job. And then think about what contributions you feel you can make with your specific strengths. So everybody has different gifts and different abilities and think about, um, the, the contribution that you think you can make in your career with those. And then think long term. So um, reconsider all of these things at every career stage. Maintain enough variety so that you can evolve your career in a way that you want to. Don't ever feel like you're in a position where you can only do one one thing. Um, think about you know what's going to um, keep you interested because we we're all in it for the long haul, and we want and you serve your patients better if you. Um, are happy in your career. And then eventually um, spend, spend your time doing what only you can do. Um, so we're gonna hear from two other surgeons today. Um, you know, not many surgeons can do fetal surgery. So if you can do fetal surgery, spend your time doing fetal surgery. Um, so really think about um, uh, these aspects when you consider your career. And thanks again so much for um, uh, inviting me to speak. I meant to put up my email address there, but it's um, andrea.simpson at unityhealth.to. And um, my Twitter handle is uh, Andrea Simpson MD. Um, and I'd be happy to, um, uh, if anyone wants to get in touch with me with any further questions. Thank you so much.